All right, 2200. This is going to be a serious game. Okay, so we're going to play serious openings. Let's play E4, E5. All right, Brad is already stumped. I have three knights, E6, bishop, C4, acceler Um, Sorry to drag him. Where, where did that come from? Italian. There's two main moves here. As I'm sure most people know, bishop, C5, and knight, F6. The move that I've been consistently recommending in the speedrun, the move that I've played over the board recently, is knight, F6, which allows the fried liver. So if you're playing knight, F6, you have to know first and foremost the fried liver. D4 is... Uh, another viable sideline for white that you have to know. So this is the uh, transposition to the Italian... Or I think it's called the Scotch Gambit, technically. The Scotch Gambit after e5. So if, if white plays e5 here, it's the Scotch Gambit. In this position, you can actually move the knight. So like knight g4, knight e4 are legitimate alternatives. But, you know, there is a move that you have to know here, which is considered to be the most reputable by far. And that is uh, d5, which is pretty common in, you know, it is most commonly known in this position, but it's an idea that exists elsewhere as well. And now there is a crossroads. So traditionally, knight e4 has always been considered essentially the only move. Knight e4 is the main move. It was always considered far superior to all of the other lines. But recently I stumbled on a really interesting alternative, which has become quite popular in recent years and that is knight back to d7 which on its face doesn't you know might not seem like bad or good it's just another move it's it's a retreating move now it basically covers the covers the pin so knight takes d4 is not effective here if white plays knight takes d4 well first of all we can take the pawn on e5 but we can also even take the knight on d4 and then just go c6 so what white has to do here is play bishop takes c6. I'm hoping that Brad might not be quite as familiar with this line. And I'll be able to take him out of theory. Now, full disclosure, I don't really know the theory that well myself. I know a couple of moves here, but that's about it. Okay, so we'll see what Brad comes up with here. Bishop takes c6 is the only move that I'm familiar with. Okay, Brad castles. I, I suppose that's also possible and maybe even a transposition to the main line okay so we need to develop obviously we need to develop i think some people might be inclined to play a6 here but that's a completely unnecessary waste of time because remember white is very likely to take on c6 on their own volition so a6 would essentially you know compel white to do what he wants to do anyway so I don't really like bishop b4. I feel like the bishop on b4 would be very, very loose. Bishop c5 is interesting. But if we consider bishop c5 after bishop takes c6, bc, knight takes d4. As you'll see, uh, if we go down the main line, it, it is actually quite important to have the c5 square open for a pawn. We want to be able to play c6, c5 once this uh, trade occurs. So we're going to play bishop out to e7. Maybe not the most principled. I, I don't know if castles is an inaccuracy compared to bishop c6, but if Brad takes on c6, we basically transpose to uh, we basically transpose to the main line. Hopefully everything so far making reasonable amount of sense. Yeah, Brad is good. So... Again, a, a crossroads here, I suppose, for white. He's got to decide whether to take on c6 or to take on d4 or to play a neutral move such as rook e1. But if I were white, I, I, I don't really see, you know, the reason to delay bishop takes c6 and knight takes d4. Okay, well, Brad's taking taking his time and plays knight bd2, which I like seeing. I, that doesn't seem like a dangerous move. Not sure exactly why... Brad is holding off on bishop takes c6. Now, first of all, it's important to establish that we cannot take on e5, because after knight takes e5, no matter which way we capture, we're going to be pinned in the end. So, what should we do here? How should we unpin ourselves? Well, again, not some people's instinct is to play a6, but we don't need to do that. The better move is to castle, because that's a helpful developing move as well. Rookie 1. Okay. 
So Brad defends the pawn. Let me think for a second here. All right. I think an idea is crystallizing in my mind. It's a pretty risky idea, but I think a very interesting one. And if it works out, um, I think we might be able to punish white for for not uh, taking on c6 and taking on e5 in time. So how do I explain this move? Well, if you look at this position from a, a general perspective, the most annoying thing to me about the position is the presence of this pawn on e5, right? This pawn is hanging over our entire position. It's cutting off some arteries. It's cutting off Main Street. Like, we cannot get anything to the 6th rank. It's a problem. So we have... Oh, we actually have an, <laughs> perhaps an even cooler move. Yeah, so from that perspective, the idea that I have is to play f6 and try to uh, remove this pawn from the board, essentially at all costs. The other really interesting move we could make, and this is typical for this position, is knight d to b8. Back to b8 in order to reinforce the other knight on c6 and open up the pathway for the bishop. And it's not as crazy of a move as it appears. But in this case, I think f6 is more concrete, and it just seems a little bit juicier, if you will. So let's go with f6. Now, some of you are probably thinking, okay, what about e6? Isn't that really terrifying? Well, once white plays e6, that pawn is going to be incredibly weak. And we've got all these pieces clustered in the center. We don't have to be afraid of that pawn on c6. Okay, so Brad takes, we take back. And notice that if white plays knight takes d4 now, we play knight takes e5, and our knight then simultaneously guards the c6 square, and our bishop comes out just in time to defend the e6 square, otherwise there would be a knight fork. So if white takes on f6, we take back with the bishop in order to keep d4 protected. I don't want to give away the d4 pawn if we don't have to. We're going to try to cling to this pawn if possible. Now this, pull this, you know, this might not be, the way we played here with f6 might not be great, uh, but I think it's interesting and it's and it's quite challenging. Okay. It's quite possible that f6 is a mistake. It, it's quite possible that knight db8 <laughs> is the best move. And I think Brad has just played correctly there with, with um, e6. There was one thing that I missed. Yeah. Um, I missed one key detail, unfortunately. But it's it's really not, I don't think it's the end of the world. So what should we do? Where should we go? Um, the issue is that if we go knight c5, then we allow knight takes d4. And then it's legitimately hard to get to the e6 pawn. So I think what we should do here is get this knight instead to e5. Uh, if white takes twice on e5, which is not unlikely, I mean, Brad might do that, then the king on g1 is not going to be very well defended. I mean, there's going to be no more pieces surrounding the king. And I feel like if we activate our bishops we'll be able to get attacking chances against the king. We'll also get this open f file for, for ourselves. I feel like this is the best practical decision. There is a very unfortunate line that I didn't fully account for, but we'll cross that bridge if we get there. We'll cross that bridge if we get there. So Brad taking, taking his time. No, I agree. I mean, practically speaking, the scotch gambit and Brad plays correctly, yeah. Yeah, there was something I missed there, unfortunately. I'm not in the best form at the moment. So what what was I... Okay, so we're going to have to go probably for a peace sack, which is very speculative, but I don't really see an alternative. So what did I miss? I thought that after c5, we just win the pawn. I thought after c5, we just win the pawn. Unfortunately, there's an insane line here that I failed to calculate, and I'm quite sure Brad will see it at this point. Does anybody see what I'm talking about? No, not rook takes e5. Rook e5, there's just f takes e5. No, rook e5, f e5, knight c6, queen d6, there's absolutely nothing. f4 is also completely innocuous. We take the knight, and then we can take the pawn on e6. Knight c6 blunders the knight. Our knight is still defending that square. Knight f5 is the move. And the point is that after bishop takes e6... Does anybody see the follow-up there? I only calculated up until bishop takes c6. I don't know if I can really blame myself for that too much, because this is a pretty crazy sequence. So knight f5, bishop takes e6. So a lot of you guys are saying f4 and jumping the gun. The knight is going to be hanging on f5. Not knight takes g7. 
but knight takes e7. Now looks dumb, right? Why are you know what's dangerous about that? But after queen takes e7, white has the move f4. I hope everybody's still visualizing that position. So knight f5, bishop takes e6, knight takes bishop, queen takes knight, and then white plays f4. Thank you, Rutinian, Grandmaster Rutinian for the raid. And um after we move our knight, black white plays f5 and wins our bishop somehow. <laughs> um so this is actually trouble. So I think it makes sense to veer off. I think it makes sense to veer off, but there's no good way to veer off either. Yeah, I got completely outplayed. What can I say? Um, let's think. So I saw in that in that resulting position of peace sack, we can give away the knight for another pawn and then get a big pawn center. It's not sound, it's bad for black, but it presents pretty decent practical chances, I think. Yeah, we could also play g6 here, which is my second candidate move. g6 might actually be the best move. g6, knight takes e7, queen takes e7. And although it's not amazing, we might also end up winning the e6 pawn, and then in that case, everything is justified. Yeah, let's go with g6. I think that's the most prudent continuation. Black might not even be worse here, honestly. Uh, black might not even be worse here, but does everybody see what I missed? Again, bishop, I missed that after bishop takes e6, knight takes e7, queen takes e7, there is the move pawn f4. Even though white has nothing developed, somehow we lose the piece because we move the, move the knight, then white plays f5. And the rook on e1 is pinning the bishop on e6. And there's another line there that's even crazier. I'll show, that, I'll show it after the game. Okay, so knight h6 check by Brad. See, this move I think might be a mistake. I Preliminarily, I don't know, I didn't consider this move at all, but it just seems to me that the knight is stuck on the rim. This is not, you know, what conquered. I, this just doesn't seem that scary. So where should we go with our king? Well, definitely we should step up to g7 at least, making contact with the knight on, on h6, right? That's not going to hurt. In, in addition, we know that after king h8, we create the potential for a knight fork on f7. Why allow that extra source of tactical uh, problems, right? Okay, so I gotta think for a second. I, there's some very interesting lines here to calculate. So this is a highly complex position. Now, um, there's a highly complex position. First of all, I think it's important to establish the knight cannot move at the moment. But if we play g5 to cut the knight off, then we give the knight the monster f5 square. So the most simple move, right? Let's start with the simple move. What happens if we play bishop takes e6? Well, probably Brad is going to take on e5. We take back, and then white takes on e5 again. And then our bishop on e6 is hanging. And in that resulting position, we can move our queen up to defend the bishop. But then Brad will move his queen up to e2. And both of my bishops are all of a sudden going to end up in trouble. Man, some of these tactics are just pretty mind-boggling. Like, I, I can't believe that that some of this is causing us problems, but it is. Now, we might still have to go for that line. Because I don't see an alternative at the moment. Okay, so I have to think about something. Man, it's like nothing works. Takes, takes, takes. There, nope. Hmm. So if we play queen d6, then there's bishop f4. That's the problem. Queen d6, bishop f4. Okay, now I, I just have to think in silence for a second. I think I know what we have to do. It's very scary, though. I do this with a heavy heart. We might get checkmated. I think what we need to do is just drop the knight back to c6. And I'll explain more after the game, but... This is obviously a very serious game, so I, I, I'm going to have to do some things in silence and some things I'm going to have to accelerate. Hope you guys understand. I promise that nothing will be left unexplained. Like, all of these weird moves that I'm making, I'll explain fully after the game. Thank you, Ground Zero MSQ, for the sub. Now, one idea that we have here, one idea that we have here is to push this pawn up to d4 and who can tell me what the follow-up is to that move? Why would we want to push the pawn to d4? 
So ultimately, our goal, of course, is to win the e6 pawn in a good version. So d4, how do we follow up? We follow up with queen d5. This is a classic idea, right? Clearing the square away with the pawn. The square is occupied by a pawn. You want it to be occupied by a piece, so you push the pawn forward, and then you get your piece there. Um, we also are flirting with the idea of going f5 and trapping the knight on h6. So I'm expecting Brad to, to drop this knight back to g4 while he's still... Oh, there's knight f7. Jesus, I completely missed that. I guess we have to sack the exchange now, because after queen e8, bishop h6, we lose the exchange in an even worse version. Yeah, we have to take... Yeah, we have a pawn for the exchange. It's not the end of the world. Yeah, this is... Brad is on another level this game. Um, this is not the end of the world, though. It's not The position is not lost. It's, we're worse, no doubt about it, but not, not losing. And and still, the, there's ideas of going before queen d5. For some reason, I completely forgot that f7 is accessible to the knight. Great developing move. Threatens potentially bishop takes c7. I mean, I think we should probably end up going d4 and queen d5 anyway. Yeah, c3 is correct. I guess, I mean, this is losing, but I guess queen d5 we can try. This is not resignable, but it's lost. I mean, if white is as accurate as he has been, then there's no chances here. Yeah, I mean, this is this is losing for sure. CD, CD, we gotta take. C7 is hanging, I realize that. I, that's that the least of our problems is that C7 is hanging. We gotta get our pieces out here. I mean, we're down in exchange for virtually no compensation. Well, the goal here is to develop our pieces first. I think we should start by developing our pieces and then see what happens. I'm most worried about Brad just taking on c7 here. I mean, a very classy, even classier move would be to go rook c1. That's like a GM move, rook c1. Just get the rook onto a good square. And then we might want to fianchetto our bishop instead, at least try to create some you know, inkling of tactical ideas down the long diagonal. And maybe the time can become an issue for him here. Although I, I hate to win speedrun games, like, on time. Like, I basically want to rule that out, but, you know. Obviously, um, queen b3 is possible. So some of you are looking at this saying, why doesn't white trade queens? Queen b3 is possible, but just because you've got an endgame doesn't mean that um, you know, that an extra exchange is going to be that easy to convert. You know, queen b3, we could go bishop e6, for example. And we still have a passer, so even in the end game, it's not going to be elementary for white to, to convert this extra exchange. I really want to analyze this game because I I was playing moves that I was quite sure are correct, correct. <laughs> but clearly I did something wrong somewhere. Okay, well... We gotta go bishop b7. We gotta get this bishop out somewhere, and this is as good of a square as any because it protects the knight on c6. No, but this move is even better than bishop takes c7. I mean, you guys... Okay, and queen b3. No, this is, a, like, exquisite. Um, we have to take... Yeah, the problem is if we defend this pawn, we lose that pawn. So we might as well defend the d pawn. That's the only pawn that gives us any chances at all. And, uh, okay, bishop c7, rook d7, we can keep trying. I've saved worse positions than this, you know, in my, in my career. This is salvageable. Time is becoming a bit of an issue here for white. It's a great move. That's a phenomenal move. Now this is... We can go g5, maybe. Chase the bishop away. Yeah, I'm, I'm very, I mean, to be completely honest, I'm not all that disappointed with my play. I I really don't feel like I did any, anything egregious. I I don't know where my mistake was. It seemed, I mean, maybe f6 in retrospect was a little over ambitious. Maybe I should have gotten knight db8. But gosh, this looks like it has to be. I don't know. It's hard to say. We'll we'll look with an engine. Now it's still not over. I'm trying to the way that I'm trying to approach 
this position is to take the Magnus Carlsen method, basically, of uh, one move at a time. Like, you, you try to create problems for your opponent on every move and survive one more move, one more move, get the opponent low on time, and eventually, hopefully, something is going to give. So for the moment, if, if we lose the d4 pawn, then it's resignable. For the moment, we still have the d4 pawn. So for the moment, we can still breathe. And perhaps we can even push the pawn on d3 in order to support it with a knight on b4. And, you know, he's starting to get a little bit low on time. Hope for Dharma is right. Yeah, we're going to push d3 here. I'm going to push d3 here. And then we're going to try to support it with the knight on b4. The only thing that... The only consolation that I have here is the fact that the bishop on g3 is somewhat out of the game. Is somewhat out of the game. So if we can get this knight to b4, and then if we can anchor that knight with a5, I'm thinking that we're going to have practical chances in this position. Even if we allow a trade of rooks. Even if we allow a trade of rooks. Which I don't mind, by the way. I don't really mind a trade of rooks as long as our minor pieces stay quite active. This is annoying. We have to trade. We have no choice. Now let's try bishop d5. Trying to get the bishop to b3. Okay. Knight d2. Six to stop bishop d6. Still, I mean, as long as I keep my 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 uh, d pawn alive, the game is not over. Which I'm going to try to do here with bishop e4. Hmm. So there's turkey one, but then we play king d5 and defend the bishop. There's king f1. I guess we can drop the bishop back. We can also go... We can go knight c2 here, maybe. Although then... Bishop c3, maybe we can go knight d4. Let's give it a shot. And that knight on c2 is pretty well placed. So maybe we can keep the knight on c2. So what if we, like... Maybe, maybe what we should do is drop this bishop back to g6. Just do nothing. I was thinking about going knight d4, but if I do nothing, I don't see exactly how Brad makes progress here, to be honest. He'll probably find some way, but I don't I don't see I don't see exactly how White makes progress here. Because we have this knight on c2 that's guarding e1 and a1. So the rook cannot really activate itself. And as long as that's the case, we're chilling. I mean hope is hope has always been there. I, I never, the position has never been hopeless. This has never been nearly, like, totally lost. It's It's been lost, but there's a difference between lost objectively and lost as in, like, there's no hope you should resign. Waiting moves, so, I mean, I, there's nothing else I can do. There's no, there's no active moves I can make here. King d5 blunders the pawn. If we start pushing our pawns, we take away real estate from the bishop. So the move f5 would be a big mistake here because of f3. Okay, knight d2. Yeah, now we can... Ooh. Okay, now I'm seeing some 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 good stuff. Wait a second. Now I'm seeing some, some genuinely decent stuff. So what is Brad's idea, first of all? For, okay, so I think what we can do here... I think Brad is trying to go knight f3... And then maybe knight back to e1, which is a very impressive idea. So how can we stop that? Well, we can try to go. We can try to go g4. We can try to go g4. And try to clamp down as much as possible on White's position. And all of a sudden, our pieces have become incredibly active. So I'm liking our chances here. I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic. Brad also has a minute and a half. I, there's no capability for me to add time, unfortunately, so even if I wanted to. Okay, and I think that's a mistake. I think that's Brad's maybe first mistake of the game. What does this allow? G3. 
And if f takes g3, we drop the knight back with a fork. And if he doesn't take on g3, then we take on f2. GMs don't die. Hard to bring us down. This is already, I think, better for black. Okay, and I think Brad is panicking. Because we play bishop takes f2, obviously. And now we've got mating ideas. There's a lot of stuff here going on. Knight e3 is a mate threat. White has one defense, I think, which he finds, and that's knight c4. Okay, so amazingly, after king d5, <laughs> white is b3. It's still not... Oh, we're almost there, but it's not quite winning. And if we go bishop h5, we drop the pawn on d3. I think what we need to do here is take a slow approach to trying to win the game. Rather than trying to do everything at once, we need to make measured improving moves. So one thing that we could consider here is to centralize the bishop with bishop e4. Just centralize the bishop, aim at the g2 pawn, and potentially prepare to push this f pawn down white's throat, if possible. Now, remember, again, that no matter what we do, what's helping us tremendously is the fact that white's rook is unable to activate itself via a1 because our knight controls that square that's greatly freeing our task I, we don't have to worry about white all of a sudden you know getting getting open here we also have a tremendous threat in this position that's kind of hidden now remember that king d5 allows b3 but we don't only have the capability of attacking the knight with the king we have the capability of attacking it with the bishop so we're actually threatening bishop d5, and Brad correctly plays b3. Only move. Only move, I'm pretty sure. But now we can start pushing our pawn down the board. Well, because now if we, if we play bishop d5, why does rook takes d3? The knight is protected. But I think what we need to do now is start pushing the f-pawn. Bishop d2 also, I think, only move. Now we can also get our king involved, by the way. We can go king d5 and try to get this king to d4. It's still very, very hard to win this. Let's go king d5. Let's get this king active. d5. I'm thinking, you know what I'm thinking? I'm thinking we can maybe get our king all the way to d4, because why not? But is that really good, though? We can also go knight d4. We can also go king c5. You know, we can also go king c5 and just try to win the pawn with our king. I want to get this king up to d4. We want to get our king as active as possible here. Just worried about that move. But I have an idea against it. And let me make this move now, and then I'll explain it later, which is bishop e3. I mean, it, there's nothing that needs explaining, I think, in this move. You can see that I'm trying to clear the pathway for my king. I mean, it's a pretty obvious move, I think, bishop e3. And, and if white plays knight takes e4, then we're winning. Bishop a5 is excellent, but I don't know if it works. So we can play king c5 here, actually. Maybe. We can also play... Bishop f4. And amazingly, white goes knight c4. Bishop d5. I think we're in good shape there. I think I think we're in good shape after bishop f4. Now we're threatening knight e3. Only move. And now we go bishop d5. In order to be able to take on, on c4 and go knight e3 check. In which case we'll win the rook. And we'll be winning. This is exactly what I calculated. God, there's a ridiculous line there. Now we can I thought we could take this actually. I thought we could take this. Sneak the king into c3. Put more pressure on White's position. We've gotten this king as active as possible. I don't see a defense for White at this point. I think he's losing, but I'm not sure. Oh my god, no, there's a ridiculous... 
Oh my goodness, there's a crazy idea here for white. No way. Oh man. I've wondered another idea. Huh. What's the conclusion there? He didn't find it. He didn't find it. White had a ridiculous save. Rook takes d3, check. King c4, rook c3, king b5, rook c2, and if king a5, rook c5 winning the bishop, it's a draw. Now white should be losing. This has been, I mean, losing, but still not over, because he still has bishop b6. But then we have bishop e3, challenging the bishop one more time. And I think we're winding our tentacles around white's pieces here. It's still not over, but seven. I mean, Brad is also dropping on the clock here. I think we should be able to get him. Because, okay, move. Make a move, Brad. Okay, he's going to lose. But this is already lost. This is already completely lost. Because we're, we're just uh, winning this pretty easily here at this point. The evaluation at the end is, okay, we, we have to, let's just turn the engine on straight away. Because there, there's so much to discuss here. Oh my god, Brad. You're the freaking, you're a monster. Now you can see, by the way, at the end that this is already lost. Um, You played like a G. I mean, you played incredibly. I feel like I also found a lot of resources, but all credit to you. Okay, it was already winning, Mr. Akshat, at the end. So let's analyze. Now, the line that I'm familiar with here, okay, castles bishop e7, is bishop c6, rook, uh, bc6, knight d4, and now the move knight back to b8. Thank you, Brad, you were a beast. And the point of knight b8 is that we, we want to go c5, and then get this knight back into the game via c6. In addition, we're preventing knight f5. This is theory. This is theory. Um, and you, you, you know, you're welcome to acquaint yourself with these lines, but this is this is theory with knight b8. The move that I was not familiar with, I was not familiar with knight bd2. I mean, this is apparently a move, but I don't know it at all. Castles and rookie one. Okay, so here I think we made a very serious misjudgment, and I played the move f6. Yeah, yeah, you can see that precisely because of the line in the game, white is now quite a bit better. Um, no, it, f6 is not a, a massive mistake, but it's it's too optimistic. Wow, the best move was a5. What? I've seen this move before in this line. I think the point is that you're trying to grab space on the queen side in preparation for this position. So the computer is basically saying, if black does nothing, so here's the logic. Here's how I would try to explain the logic. If black does nothing and passes the turn to white, the computer is basically saying that white has nothing better than to play bishop takes c6 and knight takes d4. So... The computer is saying that we have almost a... It's like a, a false start has been called in football, and Tom Brady, you know, has a free play because the penalty is going to be called anyway. White's going to take on c6 anyway. So the computer plays a5, which is a weird-looking move, but in the context of this position, it makes sense to play a5. Black is trying to grab space on the queen side, prevent the other knight from getting to b3 and maybe later to c5, and, uh, you know getting more space, and then playing c5. I don't know if that makes sense. And if white plays a4, then that creates a pretty big hole on b4, which is favorable, I think, to black. But of course, playing such a move in a game is pretty wild. The alternative here that I considered was knight d to b8, and I rejected it because of knight b3, and I figured that white takes the pawn here. So I was correct in not liking this. The other move was, was um, and you can see it was giving f6 initially. But at a higher depth, it, it, it rejects it. So basically, knight c5 takes, takes, takes. And now queen up to d7 to defend. The pawn was also very much viable for black. So either of these options was... Either of these options was, was possible. So anyways, um, we played f6. And as I told you guys, I forgot that after e6, knight e5... Knight d4, and by the way, notice that knight takes e5 is very, very bad for white. 
this position is already almost lost because of bishop d6. And if the rook goes back to e1, black develops a ma massive attack against white's ex extremely exposed king. I mean, on a basic level, white is so badly developed here that he's neither able to keep his king protected nor able to keep the e6 pawn protected. So I think a lot of people would make this mistake. A lot of people here would take twice on e5 and think, oh, I've got this nice looking rook on e5 and I've got the pawn. And this is just like missing the forest for the trees, if that makes sense. Forgetting that, oh, well, in, in reality, white's pieces are very poorly coordinated, undeveloped. And now the king on g1 is very exposed. So the move here is knight takes d4. So c5 is, is possible. It's not a bad move. Knight f5. And now bishop takes c6, loses a piece. Takes, takes, and f4. This is the line that I was referencing during the game. And wherever the knight goes, white plays f5. And because of the pin... Black loses the bishop. Does that make... And the amazing thing, this is what I implied I would show after the game, bishop g4. At first, I was very excited. Oh, this traps the queen. But no, queen takes g4. And the queen on e7 is undefended. And knight f3 check. Oh, well, at least we win the rook on e1. No, we don't. Knight takes f3 and the rook is protected. There's literally not a single resource here. Black just loses a piece, which is pretty wild. So for that reason, we decided to veer off and play g6. And now Brad responds correctly. So I only considered knight takes e7 check, after which black has a pretty decent position. But Brad found this idea, knight h6, and now knight f3. And here I was unable to, to find, apparently, the only move, which is queen d6. And what after bishop f4? Wow, queen b6. Jesus. <laughs> Just leaving the king to fend for itself. So apparently this was the only way to preserve a, a playable position. But I mean, this also gives up the pawn on d5. This is a pretty ridiculous, like, computer idea. Queen d6, queen b6. Like, walking right into bishop f4. Yeah, so... So, knight c6, right? Why did I play knight c6? Basically, I... First of all, I missed knight f7. I thought that I would be able to play d4, queen d5, and eventually maybe win the pawn. I only considered knight g4, and now I thought after g5, okay, the position remains very complicated. But, like, obviously white threatens to take twice on e5, so something has to be done with the knight on e5, and it's unclear what to do, because this allows knight takes e5, and then queen takes d5. So I figured dropping the knight back is the best option. But yeah, after knight f7, I correctly gave up the exchange. It's the only move. Bishop f4, d4, c3 is very strong as well. Queen d5 is good. Cd, okay, according to the engine, knight takes d4 might have been a slightly better option. Cd, cd, rook c1 is good. Bishop b7 is correct. Queen b3. So queen b3 is actually inaccurate by Brad. He's played this almost perfectly so far, but queen b3, uh, as I told you guys, it, you shouldn't go out of your way to, to trade queens in, in positions where the queens aren't necessarily favoring your opponent. I think white should have simply taken on c7. Now, you can see that it's plus 1.67. It's not like, okay, it's not resignable. It's not nearly resignable. But it's very bad. I mean, rook c8, bishop back to g3. And as long as white can keep this pawn contained, white is an extra exchange and white should be able to win the game. But okay. So Brad goes queen b3. We took it, and I correctly played rook d8. I was actually quite happy that I found this idea, just rook d8, giving away the c7 pawn and focusing, putting all of our eggs in the d4 pawn basket. So rook c4. Rook c4 is very good. Now I play g5, also correct. Bishop c7, rook d7, bishop g3, and at this point, d3 is correct. I played this stretch very well. So knight b4 is not best. Bishop b4 apparently was, was better um, to protect the d2 square. And yeah, not patting myself on the back or anything. Hashtag arrogant stream. I don't understand g5. So g5 essentially forces the bishop to decide what to do. Well, I'm trying to take away the f4 square from the bishop. I, first of all, I'm provoking bishop takes c7, and I don't want the bishop to be able to return to f4. Why is that important? Because... The f4 square and this diagonal in general allows the bishop to keep the pawn constrained. 
Does that make sense? When the bishop comes back to g3, it's pretty much locked up on g3. It cannot rejoin the game through f4. So that's one less piece that white can put in charge of guarding this pawn. Yeah, so Brad plays rook d1, knight b4. Now rook c7 is very good. Yeah, now we get this endgame. Bishop d5, knight d2, bishop c5. Knight c4 is very strong. King e6, bishop a5, bishop b4. I mean, we're playing all the top moves here. King f1, knight c2, bishop c3, bishop back to g6. So you can see that white is better, but the computer is not seeing anything like super concrete here. And now g4 is very important to prevent knight f3. Well, you push past pawn to h3, and h3 is, is finally the breaking point. After g3, we're already much better. B4, bishop f2, knight c4. And here I probably didn't find the best way to win. I just want to go to the end for a second and show Brad your defensive resource. So already here we're winning, but I messed up. Oh, apparently king e4 is still winning here. Apparently king e4 is still winning in this position. But the resource was rook takes d3 check. King takes d4, rook c3 check. Now it might you might say, well, wait a minute. The king just drops back and attacks the bishop. But after rook takes c2, if you take the bishop, you get forked again. Thank you, Crambox, for the prime. So this was a crazy resource that could have saved the game at the very end. I mean, maybe not save the game because black can drop the king around to e4. And this is a highly complex endgame, but because black is so active here, black should be winning. So I could analyze this endgame for like an hour. I am getting really exhausted, though. Uh, it's like I am I can barely formulate my sentences. So I'm thinking that maybe I can take a rain check on analyzing this particular endgame. Um, I'll, 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 I'll analyze a little bit on my own and maybe present some key ideas next stream. Let's check the... I'm, I'm just curious to see what our accuracies were. I think this was a pretty high-level game overall. Oh, why does it do this? It just doesn't... Oh, there we go. Yeah, not as, as great as I thought. So I ended up winning, but... Because Brad played knight d2 check. King a4, bishop b6. And at this point already, the game is over. First thing to, to note is that... Um, as I said, when you're up material, I think one of the greatest myths that's over overstated, not Sinatra with a thousand bits, is this concept that you always have to trade when you're up. And if you know if you miss a chance at simplification, that's automatically a mistake. Not true at all. So in this position, Black's king is weaker than White's, and you can tell that just by the pawn structure around Black's king. Right? We've got all this damage that's done, and White's up in exchange for God's sake. So there is no need to trade queens here. Trading queens actually gives this passed pawn on d4 a little bit more life. The more pieces on there's an inverse, inverse um, correlation between how many pieces are left on the board and how effective a passed pawn is. If you take everything off the board, then a passed pawn is a potential game winner. If you know it's a middle game, this pass pawn is going absolutely nowhere. It's never going to make its way past d3 because white's protecting that with 300 pieces. Does that make sense? So for that reason, Brad should have taken on c7 here and then moved the bishop back either to g3, but I would prefer to put it on f4 again to protect the d2 square. So queen b3 gives us quite a bit of life. So rook d8. Now rook d8 is another important move. I think quite a few people... And the computer is calling it a mistake. But I, you can see that there's a contradiction between it, it giving it a mistake. But if you give it more time, I think it actually ends up... Um, I think it actually ends up liking it more at a higher depth. Yeah, I think rook d8 is one of the better moves. And I think quite a few people here probably would go rook c8. Which is not... A horrible move but it's way too passive right you can't but you can't burden yourself with a c7 pawn this pawn on c7 is not this is, is irrelevant to the game the only relevant thing is whether black is going to be able to keep the d4 pawn so everything that i do from here on out in the next 10 moves 
was in one way or another aimed at either preserving or increasing the uh, intensity of the d4 pawn, including the move rook d8. And then the move g5, which is aimed at taking away the f4 square from white's bishop. And as you can see, the top computer recommendation is actually not to take on c7, but to drop the bishop back to d2 in order to keep this pawn blockaded. So that's kind of interesting, right? Bishop c7, so natural. But after the bishop is excommunicated to, like, Siberia, it can never go back to f4 again as long as the pawn remains on g5. So d3. Now we push the pawn. Now we push the pawn. Why are we pushing the pawn? Well, <laughs> past pawns are meant to be pushed, right? Here I judged that the pawn on d3 is going to be safe because the knight can jump to b4 if needed. The bishop can come out to a6 if needed. And, you know, the further along a pawn is, the more it strains the opponent's resources. So d3. Rook d1. And now knight b4, apparently possibly inaccurate. And I saw that it allows a rook trade, but I figured the most important thing is to keep this pawn protected. But according to the engine, the best move was bishop b4. Now, what is the idea of this move? Who can explain why Why put a bishop on b4? Why not a knight? I mean, knight on b4 makes a lot of intuitive sense because it protects the pawn. But what's the point of putting a bishop there? Why is this the best move? Well, it's to control the d2 square, right? Knight b4 defends the pawn. Bishop b4 controls the square in front of the pawn. Now, does black necessarily want to play d2 on the next move? Probably not. It's probably premature. Like, let's say white plays h3. What black should do here is secure the bishop with a5, just so we don't have to worry about it. And the pawn on d3 is perfectly safe. It's essentially inaccessible. I mean, the only way to attack it is to play knight e1. But now black can already take this knight. That's why we put the bishop on b4. And then, wow, look at this beautiful idea the computer is giving. Bishop a6. And this is what happens when past pawns reach the third rank. You get a lot of these tactical ideas that are connected with sacrificing other pieces and then promoting your past pawn or forcing your opponent to give away a lot of pieces for it. For it. This makes a draw because white must give up his rook for the passer. So that's a cool idea that's a byproduct of you know the pawn reaching d3. And so knight b4 apparently is a mistake because it allows the rook trade. Okay, so now bishop d5. And the idea of bishop d5 is to attack the pawn on b3 and force white to go a little bit more passive. Now bishop c5 to activate the bishop and pin the f2 pawn. And Brad played a very nice move, knight c4. Getting this knight on an anchor point and opening up more pressure on the d3 pawn. Okay, now I brought my king up to e6, and this is a very concrete idea. Who can remind me what I'm preventing by playing king e6? Because white does have a threat, potentially. What is the threat here? What is it? Oh, Artie Bear asked why I didn't take on f3. I'll explain that in a second. So what is white threatening? What, what, what squares is this knight covering? Bishop d6, right? Bishop d6, good. As we're paying attention. Bishop d6 is a huge threat because it forces a trade. And now with the rooks off the board, every subsequent trade is in white's favor because black just doesn't have a lot of pieces to go around. Uh, you might look at this and say, well, is, doesn't bishop take c4 win a piece? Well, no, it doesn't because white takes on c5. Bishop takes b3, rook d2, and the pawn on d3 is lost because the knight, you cannot keep the knight on b4. Okay. Oh, and this is really cool. Knight a6, rook takes d3 anyway. Knight c5, rook c3. And white wins, uh, white wins the piece back and wins the game. Crazy, how many how many tactics there are in these types of positions. So, for that reason, oh, Artie was asking why I didn't take on f3. So that's exactly the same reason. When you have so few pieces, you can every subsequent trade is really really bad because now white's going to play bishop a5 and disattach the knight from the pawn and just win the pawn. You actually need your your light squared bishop. Uh, in order to potential, in order to act as a potential defender of this one, does that make sense? Already, Bear, you asked the question, so I don't know if my explanation made sense. To that okay, so Bishop D three, Bishop D five, Bishop C five, King E six, Bishop A five. Now Brad was threatening to take and then to take. Okay, so we played, 
what did we play? We played bishop e4, defending the pawn. And that's why the bishop on e4, that's why we needed to keep the light squared bishop alive. King f1. And by the way, rook e1 is not as dangerous as it looks because we can play either f5 or king d5 and the bishop is perfectly safe. So king f1, we go knight c2, and I think this is the turning point in the game. I honestly think that once we put the knight on c2, things got a lot harder for white. Thank you, Chaos. Things got a lot harder for white because the rook is now completely confined. It cannot get active. And although the computer effortlessly maneuvers around this, uh, even you can see, even the engine at a pretty high depth doesn't feel like white is all that much winning. And possibly even white is not winning at all. 1.5 in such a position might mean that, yes, white is up in exchange, but that generally means the computer doesn't see an exact path forward. Why move his king and not take your knight with bishop takes before? That's a good question. So I felt like the two bishops are very strong here. One of them defends the pawn, the other controls the squares in front of it. It's quite difficult for white to make any progress here. So this specific peace tandem, the two bishops, are the best that black can get. I know I just said that every subsequent trade is beneficial to white, but this is the one exception because these bishops are incredibly active. Why couldn't white have gone 91 earlier to target the d-pawn? So I'm. do you mean here? Because here we can take on b3, attacking the rook and then drop the bishop back to c4 to defend the pawn. So I don't think there was an, a good opportunity for white to play knight e1. I, ju I don't think so. I mean, white could have played knight e1 here. But again, this is not very impressive because white's not even attacking the pawn. Okay, so hopefully that was adequately explained. King f1, knight c2, bishop c3. So now we drop our bishop back to g6, and this is where I reference the sort of Russian school of chess, just do nothing, move back and forth. Well, black doesn't have anything that he can do. Like, we can't really do anything. I'm not, you obviously can't push the pawn. White doesn't have any easily accessible targets. So I was basically planning just to go back and forth with my bishop, maybe also push the king side pawns and grab a little bit of space, maybe make it even harder for white to, to make moves. Does that make sense? So th this is a very important ability, right? In the end game. To, to be able to say, okay, like I've reached a situation where I think everything is well defended. If you're trying to make a draw, knowing when to do nothing is a very important skill. So bishop g6. And now I want to draw your attention to one of the to the computer's top recommendation, which is a ridiculously instructive move. B4 is the computer's top choice. Look at that move. Who can explain to me the idea? Why are we why is white sacrificing the pawn? Like, what, what the heck? To activate the rook. Peace activity is so important in the endgame. This allows the rook to squeeze by through a1. And if we go back to c2, well, it's already too late. The rook has now gotten active along the a file. And why is that important? Well, because blacks, you know, without a rook, blacks minor pieces have a hard time keeping things together, right? If you go king d5, b3, and now the bishop is pinned, and the pawn is hanging, and things start to crumble at the seams. So, of course, black can decline the sacrifice and move this bishop back, but now there's a crazy idea b3, and then knight back to b2 in order to win the pawn that way. For example, here, knight b2, knight takes b4, bishop takes b4, bishop takes b4, knight takes d3, white has succeeded taking the pawn. The game is not over. Black has very active pieces, and Black can still try to make a draw here, but without the pawn, I think it would be very difficult. What a ridiculous idea. B4, then B3, and knight back to B2. Are you kidding me? And people say endgames are boring. B4. Look at how many components there are to this. This is also a sacrifice with the idea of activating the rook. If the sack is declined, the knight is fianchettoed with the aim of winning the pawn on D3. The engine is ridiculous. Yeah, unfindable. So Brad dropped the knight back to d2, which allowed us to clamp further onto white's position, g4, stopping knight f3. Now you might ask, why was knight f3 dangerous? Well, the reason it was dangerous to allow knight f3 is because from f3, the knight can swing back to e1, attacking the d3 pawn or forcing a trade. And the last piece that we want to trade, this knight on c2 is the golden piece. 
it's totally limiting the rook, so we don't want it to get traded. Hopefully everything is making a fair degree of sense so far. So we play g4 to stop knight f3. And here Brad kind of collapses and plays h3. So as you can see, according to the computer, knight should have gone back to c4, and then white could have reverted back to the idea of b4. But this tells you how hard it is to win this endgame already at this point. So h3, g3. And b4 is a further mistake... I think that probably the most practical chance for white was to take on g3 here, actually, and allow knight e3 check and go king e1. Now, here, black can take the rook, but it makes sense to take the pawn first and then drop the knight back to e3. This is the same version, just with an extra pawn. And if you take on d1, black has great winning chances here, but I think that probably this was objectively the best drawing chance for white. Um, but Brad goes b4, allowing bishop takes f2. At first, I thought the game is over immediately because we have checkmate threat. But knight c4 only move, and it's not so easy. And if, you know, if king d5, then b3. And I didn't see a clear path forward. But apparently, according to the engine, there is a winning move here. Either bishop d4 or even knight back to d4 attacking b3. And if bishop takes d4 after after king takes d4, black is already winning. Why is black winning here? Because, first of all, white's king is totally caged in. Second of all, there's a massive threat of bishop h5, bishop e2, checkmate. Black's pieces are overwhelming here. This pawn is too far advanced. The king is too active. There's a mate threat. White is unable to hold everything together. Hopefully that makes sense. There's just too many sources of problems here. So the move here was knight d4. I, for some reason, I didn't spot knight d4. I kind of stopped at this position. Yeah, always bring your king up. This is a good illustration of how important it is to keep the king active. So I played bishop e4. And the reason I played bishop e4 was to try to get this bishop back to d5 and get this knight off of c4 so that we could deliver checkmate. But I totally forgot about b3. And now bishop d5 is too late. Rook takes d3, and now white is winning. Because this is no longer checkmate. Obviously because of king e2. So now black has to find another way to make progress. And so I decided on f5. I tried to get this pawn forward and try to push it all the way to f3 in order to create another passer. But Brad beats me to the punch again. Bishop back to d2, stopping f4. So this is where I decided to activate my king, king d5. And now Brad plays b5. Now, again, you can see that the computer's evaluations at a high depth don't always correspond to what the top is saying. But here, apparently, already black's advantage has largely evaporated. And if white goes bishop f4, I think white's got a fortress here is what the computer is saying. I think white has a fortress here. Well, bishop takes g2 doesn't work because the knight on c4 is defending e3. I think basically white has a fortress here. And remember that as soon as white takes on b4, that as soon as black takes on b4, white's rook immediately goes to a1 and gets active. So it's just incredibly hard for black to make any progress here. A fortress is a situation, well, just like a fortress in real life, right? It's it's something that's it's a position that is impossible to break through, in which it is impossible to break through. So it usually implies a draw. A fortress is a situation where one side has built up a defensive construction that is impossible to infiltrate or penetrate. So you can't make progress. Yeah, I mean, of course, some positions genuinely are fortresses, and this is probably one of them. But Brad, by going b5, allows us to get our king active, king d4. And now it's too late to go bishop f4, because we've already breached the fortress with our king. So knight d6, bishop b3 now. What's the idea of bishop b3? Well, it's to capture on d2 and pave the way for the king to move to c3. Now we get that bishop back to f4, which is apparently not the best move. Better was to play f4 and f3 and revert back to my old plan. And here, bishop d5, b6, and apparently the winning move here was bishop takes c4. bc, and now simply a takes b6. And then king takes c4. And we get a similar situation to what we've discussed previously. Overwhelming. This is just overwhelming. But instead of this, I for some reason took on b6 and went king c3. 
completely forgetting about this final drawing resource. Rook takes d3 check, and then rook c3 check. Artibir was asking, bishop takes c4, bishop takes a7. Oh, if bishop takes c4, ba7, then simply bishop back to d5, stopping the pawn. And if b7, well, that doesn't threaten anything because the other bishop guards b8. Now, I saw bishop takes c4, but for some reason I only considered knight e3 check. And after king g1, if you play knight takes d1, white wins. B takes a7, and now the pawn is unstoppable. So, a lot of tricks even here. But here I missed the calm a takes b6. I just forgot that you can do that. So, one final chance for Brad here. Rook takes d3 check, which I already illustrated. But once he missed that... Our king gets back to a4, we go bishop b3. This is already winning for black. Just because, I mean, it, this is already overwhelming. White has no more pawns left, and this gets, one way or another, we're going to get a knight to e3 or pawn to f3. This is winning. Wow. Okay, I, I now I'm a little bit more satisfied at the way we analyze the endgame. So I hope you guys found that somewhat informative. We barely scratched the surface. I'm sure there's a lot more to discuss. This was one of the... Most complicated and most interesting games I've probably ever had on the speedrun. So thank you, Brad. You're you're the man of the hour. Thank you guys. Thank you for hanging out, everybody. This was great. I'll see you later. Bye everybody.